But having said that, I've spent some time reviewing recent literature and going back to work that I did with John House and Kira Petrovsky in writing a paper for the Countdown Symposium on this topic in 2015. Much of that work is still very applicable to this session and the article has been circulated for your reference. Whilst it would always be good to have more evidence on this, it's clear that there is an increased awareness and sensitivity about optimising the use of antibiotics. And in dairy cattle, mastitis is the number one reason for an antibiotic treatment and the number one reason for antibiotic violations in bulk tanks. And after infertility, mastitis is the second most common reason for a dairy cow to be culled from a herd. And also it's often a source of angst on farm due to a high number of cows with repeat clinical mastitis. And also that threat of, of treated cow's milk reaching the bulk tank. I'm confident that this webinar will challenge your views on clinical mastitis management and challenge what is happening on farm. There is a lot in this webinar as, and it's a complex topic. Um, and as Steph said, it'll be made available on a, on a recording uh, to come back to for, an, for reference. We understand that there is also great interest in rapid diagnostics, either on farm or in vet clinics. And if there is interest um, as a result of this webinar, we'll look to develop another topic on this. The Countdown team is also planning to broadcast a webinar aimed more specifically for farmers in April. So in the advertising for this webinar, we noted that you'll be able to answer the question, what's the strongest drug? We did this to get your attention and to sign up, but, because, but also um, it's one of the most common questions we get. And the irony of this question is that no one knows the answer. In today's webinar, I will share a framework that Countdown has developed for understanding the situation better on farm, to be able to provide much broader support rather than being pinned on what is the best drug. In my experience, many vets when faced with this question are quite daunted. And instead of leaning into the conversation and learning more about what is happening on farm, take the question on face value and offer a a different product, which is often not justified. Also through this webinar, we'll see that the issues with clinical mastitis is, are very rarely related to the drug. In deciding to treat a cow with clinical mastitis, the first aim is to return the quarter affected and the milk to being clinically normal. The second aim is to eliminate the mastitis causing the pathogen to prevent further damage to the udder and to maintain milk production and have a low somatic cell count. The, all these aims um, have to be done in a cost effective way without causing any residues. In discussing this topic, I'd first like to look at our current challenges, the risks we face with management, and then spend most of the time considering the opportunities we have, both in terms of servicing clients or suppliers, but more importantly, in better outcomes for cow welfare and the dairy businesses in which we are involved. If I could spend all my time talking about prevention, I'd be very happy, as this is where the biggest gains with mastitis control are. Put simply, you can never treat your way out of a mastitis problem. Plenty of farmers and vets have tried this approach, but it doesn't work. When there is good control, clinical mastitis is not an issue at all in terms of costs, residues or cow wastage. However, treating clinical mastitis is important, so we'll get stuck into it. This is the Countdown Mastitis Dynamics Chart, which is a way of conceptualising what's happening on farm in terms of how cows are becoming infected and how some cows are being treated. What we'll discuss, discuss today is how we can do a better job of moving infected cows and in particular clinical mastitis cows back to the clean group of cows. The harsh reality is that the, that the proportion of cows that are able to be cured and move back to the clean group is reasonably low. On a lot of data analysis over the past decade, about one in five cows that get clinical mastitis will be culled by the end of lactation in most herds. This is a sobering metric that should stimulate activity to ramp up prevention 
but also look at what opportunities exist to improve cure rates on farms. For most dairies, we still diagnose mastitis based on the cow's immune response and use clinical signs without any confirmative culture or bacterial identification. This is changing on some farms that use on-farm rapid diagnostics or transport samples for rapid diagnostics at local vet clinics. In these cases, they're using the samples to, to decide on whether a cow in fact needs a treatment or not. This is referred to as culture-based therapy. Culture-based therapy does offer great opportunity to reduce antibiotic use. Following a process of sampling every cow with mastitis and then culturing it or an, another diagnostic method, if the cow is not systemically ill, treatment can be withheld whilst waiting 24 hours to determine the causative pathogen. If the pathogen isolated is gram negative or there was no growth, there is good evidence, at least outside of Australia, that these cows do not need to be treated with antibiotics and do not, need, do not have any worse outcomes, such as repeat mastitis, high cell count or reduced milk production compared with treated counterparts. The benefit of this approach will depend on a range of factors, such as the pathogen profile of an individual herd, the accuracy of the diagnostic test, and also the capability of people interpreting the test results. But discussion about rapid diagnostics is a big enough topic in itself. And um, if there's interest, we'll develop another topic on this. Another challenge is that farmers are almost exclusively diagnosing and making decisions on treatments of, of clinical mastitis. So my question here is, how do we really know what, what's happening with respect to what they are calling a case of mastitis that needs treatment? Again, from experience, discussing this topic somewhere else other than at the dairy with cows in front of you may be very different to what's actually happening on farm. And further to that, even when you are at the dairy, at the time when clinical mastitis cows are being treated, there will be a varied and differing opinions from staff from one side of the rope tree to the other. Further, with most cows and most farms at the start of treatment, we don't know what's causing the mastitis. We don't know how the antibiotics will distribute in the udder following treatment, and we don't know what antibiotic to choose. To further highlight some of the challenges we face, I'd first like to share the summarised findings of a small study of surveyed farmers from a master's research project. Brianna Down-Smith investigated the current attitudes, farm management and antibiotic practices when treating clinical mastitis in herds in Gippsland. This study was completed in 2017 and provides some insight into farm practices with the treatment of clinical mastitis. I'm confident that many of you listening in today will not be surprised by some or all of these survey findings. 27% of the respondents had no permanent record of their treatments. 42% of farms, farmers do not consult a veterinarian prior to changing their clinical mastitis treatment. 35% of respondents used mastitis treatments off-label. And when using products off-label, 50% of owners and farm managers did not extend the withhold period. 33% of respondents did not use any disinfection prior to infusion. And 29% of respondents said that using a rapid mastitis test was important in diagnosing clinical mastitis. And 11% used anti-inflammatories for cows with clinical mastitis. So again, this inf information may provide some of you with the motivation to ask more questions about how mastitis is diagnosed and treated on farms. The risks of poor outcomes in managing clinical mastitis are great. Common problems of overdiagnosis and poor treatment practices can lead to losses from reducing saleable milk, cost of medications, but also very significant on some farms is the loss of cows. Why cows leave the herd, in my opinion, is not talked about enough. And with recent work in another project looking at antimicrobial stewardship on farms, it's been interesting to see the proportion of cows leaving the herd due to mastitis, which may have been pre prevented. 
When I discuss appropriate diagnosis and treatment with producers, I often emphasise the importance of the first treatment if a cow presents with mastitis. Decisions and management at this time are critical because if the treatment does, doesn't go well, the cow may have a prolonged illness and may need to be treated again. And the chance of success at the second treatment is markedly less. In this way, when a cow presents with mastitis, you have one chance of saving the cow's life. And I don't think this is overstating the importance of good decisions at this time. And there's also risks associated with antibiotic violations and the anxiety around that. Also in a published uh, paper last year, Richard Shepard and John Morton found cows that had clinical mastitis after the first pregnancy uh, test had 2.7 times higher chance of early embryonic loss, which given the inflammatory cascade that occurs and prostaglandin release is not really a surprise. But given the current practice on some farms and global trends to improve the use of antibiotics, we need you as milk quality advisors, whether you're a veterinarian, a field officer, herd improvement manager, or someone else who interacts with farmers, to be careful observers and supporters of improved practices in clinical mastitis management. In my experience, the process of understanding what is happening on farm then stimulates the inquiry as to why things are happening the way they are. This second deeper level understanding is always enlightening and at the heart of nearly all the crazy things that happen on farm is that people are essentially caring for their animals and wanting to do the best that they can. For the most part, they are doing the best they can until they know better. So now we'll look at some other resources that can hopefully aid your confidence in delving into this area of dairy management. And now looking forward at opportunities that are available for us now as mastitis or milk quality advisors. I'd first like to share a framework for understanding what's happening on farm, which will then help focus areas that need clarification. Then we'll take a look at how treatment protocols can improve management and then also delve into some details about the development of treatment protocols and the evidence for some interventions. And I do apologise to some of the non-vets in the audience in advance as there'll be a few details that are quite veterinary but it won't, uh, it won't be for too long. So this is a process that we circulated before the webinar, uh, a process for evaluating what's happening on farm that Countdown has developed. By drawing out the different decision points we are able to see where errors may be occurring it's kind of like a HACCP approach, a hazard analysis and critical control point. This has been used in the Countdown MQ program, the course training field managers, veterinarians, extension officers, technicians and other dairy advisors. People doing this course have found this process to be, useful tool, to be a useful tool to broaden the conversation away from the question of which antibiotic. There are seven decision points or nodes here and through experience and published literature, the causes of poor outcomes are often associated with areas other than the treatment itself. We'll use this process throughout the remainder of the webinar to review areas that may need improvement. Furthermore, I've consistently observed that in particular vets, but also field officers are wary of entering these conversations because they don't know the answer to the question that's being asked. But this framework provides the opportunity to be engaged in the conversation and not run away from it as you don't, if you don't know the answer. You don't need to know the answer, but if you're going to provide value to the conversation, you do need to know the questions to ask to understand the practices. Written protocols, once developed, are essentially a, a tool to communicate, uh, to, to support communication on farm. And no do different to any other business, we do need extra tools to improve our communication. Once it's written, it can then be critiqued. For the most part, protocols are developed in key managers or owners' minds over a long period of time, and often quite sophisticated, but hard to actually communicate to other staff. So if these virtual, sort of in the mind protocols are allowed to remain, it's almost impossible to review and discuss improvements. If staff are coached to follow the protocol, it will reduce the risks of antibiotics getting into the vat. And given the amount of over-treatment that goes on, 
Importantly, protocols should clearly outline what should and should not be treated as a case on what cows should be culled. So what information do we need? Understanding the profile of mastitis pathogens on a particular farm is important when developing protocols for treatment. However, we have to accept the challenges and perception of the value of cultures with dairy farmers. Unfortunately, many farmers have a dim view of the value and it's to do with what has happened in the past. Despite the inevitable time delays with the process of culturing at a lab and reporting, many of us veterinarians have missed opportunities in ensuring the value of taking cultures in the past. Delays in processing, and this has been caused by delays in processing and sending, delays in reporting results to clients, and then only ringing with results instead of also following up with a written report have in the past degraded the value that farmers perceive with doing cultures. And if it's important enough to spend a few hundred dollars on, it's important enough to write it down as dairy farmers are busy and need to be able to go back to a written file rather than rely upon recall of a phone call explaining the results. A PCR test on the bulk tank and pooled hospital milk may be indicated in herds where there is a concern of mycoplasma vovis and strepagalactia but we've certainly seen issues with the interpretation of PS PCR tests. So some care is needed not to mis misinterpret the output, especially given the knowledge that what can be gained from individual cultures. Understanding treatment history is also important. Taking the time to analyze records is important, which I'll touch on later. This is where our roles, in our roles, we can really help whether a farm's recording system makes ex extraction of information difficult, or it is a process of collating information sources from multiple sources. This is an area where we can support farmers in understanding what's happening. How many cows do come back after the first treatment and lactation? Which cows are affected? Are they heifers? Is it associated with calving? So in the first 14 days after calving, or is it mainly through lactation? Management factors that need to be considered before develop, developing a protocol is understanding current processes of detecting mastitis and the staff's capability to recognise clinical signs, management's motivation to alter treatments based on clinical signs and their openness for some form of training. Also understanding their current method of recording and if people making decisions on subsequent treatments can actually access the records. And also what's the, what the farm's preferred timing of administration of product is, which may in fact mean that they do not want treatments to be done every 12 hourly. I think this slide shows that the protocol development must be customised to the farm. You could use a pro forma template, but without proper engagement and questioning, it will join the other protocols in a folder on the shelf. So this is a, uh, just an example report that again, we shared with you before the webinar, I suppose just demonstrating that um, you can combine some of this information with sort of the next steps and it can be a written record. You can use TechNote 4, page, page 12, or all of TechNote 4 for, for referencing and for building some of this information so you can easily populate uh, reports or the farm guidelines, uh, farm guideline 4. So in a treatment protocol, we need to um, be aware of when a cow needs a treatment, what treatment to be given, how to administer, how to mark the cow, how and what to record, and when a cow should be culled. This is, this is an example treatment protocol that was published in the Countdown Symposium paper that I discussed before. Whilst this differentiates the different presentation of mastitis, depending on the farm, this may not even be required. So it's, it's very much a, a case of customising it to what um, is, is going to work for, for farmers. There has been more talk about treatment protocols of late, but it's important to understand that it needs to align with what the farm wants. 
and that it is in the language that is used on the farm and for the farm team to own the protocol so it's used and updated as required. So using this framework, we need to understand how and when farm teams are looking for cases and what they are defining as cases that need treatment. In my experience, it's common to find producers that are treating with any, any sign of flex in the first three squirts. So not using the countdown de definition. So in this case, they may be treating a teat canal infection, which will be made worse by an intramammary treatment or dairy staff may use a secondary test such as rapid mastitis test to then determine if a cow needs treatment and treating on account of a positive test. There is strong evidence, there is strong evidence published in anecdotal that there is no benefit in treating subclinical mastitis during lactation. The best time to treat subclinical mastitis is in the dry period. And if people do try to treat during lactation with poor hygiene, the outcomes for the cow and the producer get a whole lot worse. In this way, you can see how improper diagnosis can quickly lead to a mastitis issue when there wasn't one in the first place. Ensuring that those people advising farmers firstly themselves have a good understanding of the different forms of mastitis before then discussing the decision making on farm is important. So you can see here the definition of mild, moderate, and severe or sick milk, sick udder, sick cow mastitis, which can govern the treatment choices. So now getting to where there is a whole lot of fuss, deciding on what treatments to use. As discussed, developing an understanding of pathogen on particular farms is important along with the previous history of what appears to have worked or not. Further to that, I do want to delve into some of the evidence regarding treatments. The intramammary route of administration of antibiotics for mastitis is favoured due to the fact that far higher concentrations can be reached by this method. This method of administration is also consistent with good antimicrobial stewardship in that we're essentially using a topical application to the udder rather than administering a parenteral into the muscle or into the vein product that provides unnecessary exposure of commensal bacteria to antibiotics. In some cases, there is a variable distribution of the products in the udder, which will depend on the constituents of the product, but also the amount of swelling and massage of the product at the time of infusion. There are, however, risks of introducing bacteria with this method, which needs ongoing training and coaching of dairy workers to reduce this risk. In a study exploring the treatment of subclinical mastitis published in 2001, farmers involved in the study were trained on infusion technique, but 13% of treated cows developed mastitis caused by a different bacteria than the initial cause, demonstrating that contamination of the udder can be very common even after training. Injectable therapy may have clinical advantages over intramammary infusion when there's multiple quarters within a cow or when animal behaviour poses a safety risk to operators trying to infuse antimicrobials or in the rare event when treating large number of cows in a blitz therapy for strepagalactia treatment and sometimes in the face of a mycoplasma outbreak to decrease the spread at the time of treatment. So is there any benefit from adding an injectable antibiotic on top of an intramammary treatment? On reviewing available information on injectable products, if a cow does not have systemic signs, that is at the cow level, not other level changes, there is no evidence to support the addition of injectable antibiotics on top of intramammary products to increase the clinical or bacterial cure. Given this information, it's interesting just how common the practice of adding an injectable to an, anti, to, to an intramammary product is. What's the basis of this? Is it because inherently we feel as advisors or farmers that more is better and that it can't do any harm? Given there is no evidence to add an injectable to an intramammary treatment for mild and moderate mastitis, in my opinion, we need to acknowledge that 
we are advising this because it makes us feel better and also acknowledge that without any benefit, we are increasing the risk of AMR development. There is some, albeit scant, information about the use of antibiotics with, in cows with severe mastitis. But a lot more evidence about the use of anti-inflammatories in these cows will come to. In 2015, John House and Kira Petrovsky and I read over a large number of papers to look at the evidence pertaining to treatment of mastitis. As some of you have, may have read in the paper that was distributed before the webinar, there is also a table in, in the paper looking at inframammary products available in Australia. It's also interesting to note sometimes that the dose rate per label may be well below levels that have been used in the research, which is not that helpful when the residue studies have been completed at the label dose. So take the example of the, of the available TMS products on the market. These are used at 24 milligrams per kilogram and the literature recommends 44 milligrams per kilogram. And combine that knowledge that in adult cattle, trimethoprim has a very short half-life of 40 minutes and is poorly absorbed from the muscle. With this evidence from Gard and then later Cartanen, it is unlikely that trimethoprim is reaching the udder at therapeutic levels and therefore the sulfur will be acting in a bacteriostatic way when often this product will be combined with a bactericidal intramammary product, which is entirely counterproductive. So is there any benefit from using anti-inflammatories for clinical mastitis? There is growing evidence to support the use of anti-inflammatories in mastitis for cows with systemic signs, as well as more moderate cases. And James Breathe, Breen, the author of a paper published in Livestock in 2017 on the use of anti-inflammatories in mastitis, asked the question whether we need more evidence to justify the use of anti-inflammatories when pain relief is such an important outcome for the cow. Other supportive treatments for cows with severe mastitis uh, where they may be dehydrated include oral or IV fluids, and there are details available in published literature and commercially available products. So given the information gathered, we could summarise using the same table where possible to use intramammaries for mild and moderate clinical mastitis along with anti-inflammatories. In the more severe cases, anti-inflammatories are more than likely the most important therapy supported by intramammary and injectable antibiotics. But the use of injectable antibiotics in severe cases is um, still being questioned. A critical element in optimising treatment success is ensuring that treatments are administered hygienically and those cows with mastitis are separated from the milking herd to minimise spread. The countdown video shared with you prior to the webinar and, and also for your reference here is something that you can use with uh, dairy producers and other work colleagues. As veterinarians, I think we do need to take more responsibility for the way in which these prescriptions are being used. On some farms, I do wonder whether there is any benefit in treating cows at all, spending hundreds of dollars on products and then not bother to clean the end of the teat before putting it in, putting it in along with a whole lot of other bacteria and forcing them through a critical defence barrier. As discussed earlier, recording clearly in the, in the dairy is critical for staff to follow the labelled plan treatment, but also for staff to work out if cows have had a repeat case and should not be treated. Regular reviewing of mastitis data is important, as in my experience, there's a large amount of normalising that goes on over time where farmers will get used to the levels of mastitis and due to other pressures on farm, absorb increasingly higher culling or treatment rates. Organising data to calving time mastitis, which is clinical mastitis in the first 14 days of calving and comparing heifers and mature cows and also calculating the clinical mastitis per month during lactation makes it easy to compare between farms. Also understanding repeat cases provides great feedback on how successful the treatment process is. This top metric worked out on a cow level 
require um, varies greatly between farms from 10% to 60% of cows repeating after a, a first initial case of mastitis. And the mastitis focus report can also be used to gauge um, how treatments are going. The definition of the mastitis focus report treatment failure component is that um, if there's more than three doses within 10 days of the first dose. So if this is very high, it will certainly pay to work out if um, people are using products off label for more than three doses, or in fact, it's actually a retreatment. So recording um, is really important. Uh, and um, this is a, a board that I saw on one farm where there was um, the cow number, the quarter and the day was written onto the tube um, to aid uh, staff in the dairy and having a permanent record of, of the antibiotic use and the cows affected. And Steph, if I just, if I uh, could ask you just to comment um, on some residues, that would be terrific. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so some of you may have heard me present on antibiotic residues previously. Uh, obviously, it was quite a big part of my previous role working for a milk processor. And I guess I just wanted to flag in the context of this discussion around clinical mastitis management, um, some of the potential opportunities for residues to make their way into a vat or potentially further. So we've sort of got controls whereby we can stop residues um, from going from the cow into the vat. Um, by you know, uh, marking the cows well, having records, having cows segregated. We've also um, got ways in which we can minimise um, residues from the vat going, to, going into a, a milk tanker, for example. Um, there's increased availability of on-farm um, testing methodologies and most processes have got the ability for farmers to submit samples to their factory um, if they're concerned about potential risk. Um, the really good news is that um, in Australia, um, all tankers are um, tested for antibiotic residues before they're unloaded uh, at a factory. Um, so that will avoid um, any issues um, or should minimise the risk of any issues um, of residues then entering the silo at the factory. Um, and then there's further product testing down the chain. But ultimately, if we can really focus at avoiding residues um, from, from sort of between the cow and the vat, um, then that's a really good place for us to be working. So we jump to the next slide, Mark. So um, this is a, a pie chart um, showing the causes of antibiotic residue detections detected at the tanker. So this is um, once the milk's been picked up and arrived at the factory and tested on farm uh, for milk processes in Victoria. And we can see that over half of antibiotic um, violations are due to failure of controls. And so what we mean by that is uh, where a treated cow is not marked, uh, or she might be missed by a milker, uh, where a test bucket may not have been connected correctly, um, or a vat hose not um, disconnected. So that's a, a really, obviously, a sort of most significant cause of antibiotic positive um, violations within the dairy industry. Um, but as you can see, the, the orange box there, the 24%, um, around one quarter of antibiotic violations are due to um, an issue that we call product label. So this may be due to off-label use, uh, or in the instance where we haven't, the farmer hasn't observed the um, withholding period that's recorded on the label. Um, and so when you think about um, those figures in terms of total numbers, if we look at um, antibiotic um, positives across um, Australia, um, we average around 150 to 200 antibiotic tankers a year um, based on um, the Australian Milk Residue Survey. Uh, so when we think about 24% of those 200 positive tankers being caused by off-label use, um, it's something that we certainly should be thinking of working uh, into our, um, our treatment protocols. The next slide, thanks Mark. So um, in terms of off-label use and, and what do we mean, I certainly don't want to be um, telling anyone how to suck eggs, but there's a couple of examples of off-label use which it might surprise you that a number of farmers are not actually aware of. So probably an obvious one to us is when you increase the dose, um, the dose rate of a drug uh, as relative to what's recorded on the label, 
um, then, that, then that's off-label use. And that, that's a fairly obvious one where we may need to make adjustments to um, the withholding period. But one of the other uh, relatively common um, off-label uses, particularly with some of our 48-hour uh, intramammary treatments, is actually increasing the treatment frequency. Um, and if we refer back to that uh, a slide that Mark had on the Gippsland Social Research Survey, um, often a reason that's um, referenced is, is out of convenience. So it's, it's much easier to remember to give a drug once a day rather than every second day. So um, having the conversation with the farmers that you're working with in terms of what, what is actually going to be the most practical for them in terms of um, a treatment protocol that can be followed. Um, and then subsequently extended treatment duration. So if you have a cow that's had her three label treatments and hasn't recovered, um, what, what, what are the steps to manage um, that cow? Do we continue treatment? And if, if we do, what do we need to do um, in terms of managing that withholding period uh, to avoid antibiotic residue risks? So here's some charts um, from the Dairy UK Milkshore program, which is a national program to minimise antibiotic residue um, detections in bulk milk tankers. Um, and we can see if we deviate um, from the standard label um, dosage regime, which is um, indicated in black, um, if we were to give a couple of additional treatments, um, the level of antibiotic that's in that udder prior to starting the withholding period is much higher than if we were to give the label dose rate. So we need to put in some considerations around extending that, um, that label withholding period. And likewise, if we're giving treatments more frequently, we're also going to end up with much higher levels of, of um, antibiotics uh, in the udder prior to starting the withholding period. So here's some examples of um, on-farm situations where products are used off-label. So we can see in this case, cow 2801 was being treated with Norocox in her back left quarter, um, and she was marked with an X, which is great. So we've got the, the farm protocol there. Um, but as many of you may be aware, Norocox is labelled for use every 48 hours, and we can see that this cow was treated on the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th, and there was no adjustment made to the label um, dose rate. So this is a common example um, whereby a farmer may or may not have consulted with their prescribing vet. Um, and often in the case that they do, it may be, you know, crush side whilst doing a lame cow or over the phone. So it's really important um, to make sure that you've got that written advice um, if, if there is going to be um, any off-label use and that you are guiding farmers, particularly around the potential risks of or increased risk of residues if you do go off-label. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and here's another example. So in this particular case, um, this is a large farm um, where uh, cows were getting treated um, with a 12 hourly intramammary um, and 90% of them received more than three treatments. So off-label use wasn't a single, um, a single cow. This, this was um, routine standard practice on this farm. So if you think about the opportunity to, you know, potentially reduce the risks of this um, treatment policy on this farm, um, you know, there's, there's certainly some great opportunities in terms of managing the residue risk. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks very much, Steph, uh, for that. And um, yeah, I think we all need to be, uh, like I said before, I suppose, keen observers on, on farm to be able to identify these issues and just raise them um, because it's not um, from our different uh, professional backgrounds, it may be that you're um, working for a factory or um, a vet at a, at, a, at a farm for a different reason, just to, to be some of the checks and balances and to open up the conversation. Unfortunately, there will always be some treatment failures with clinical mastitis um, and understanding the amount of cows that have repeat cases, as I said before, is important to first know um, before investigating the, the, the possible reasons. Through further reading, um, you can see the references that I've used, uh, that we've used below, um, which I can make, make those uh, available to you. We've put together a list of some of the, the possible reasons for real or perceived treatment failure. And I think this is really helpful for you in your work um, to, to kind of, um, again, I suppose it's a, a matter of understanding um, how common some of these issues are, as opposed to what may be uh, people trying to draw you into a conversation around uh, a drug. So to start with, um, an example for this is using penicillin for um, a beta-lactamase producing Staph aureus isolate. 
and then with farm and pathogen factors, herds with high new infection rates. So the infection was cleared, but immediately a new or a different one began due to, a, due to that high infection pressure. Sometimes pathogens with poor susceptibility to an infused antibiotic, um, again, such as Staph aureus, Nocardia, yeasts or, or algae. And then there is uh, infections with a heavier burden that can be more clinical, where there can be more clinical and bacterial failures as well as gram positives are cured less than gram negatives or when there is no bacteria retrieved on culture. Then looking at some of the cow factors, studies and experience have shown that older cows, cows with previous high cell counts, repeat clinical cases, cows with multiple quarters affected, cows in later lactation, cows with damaged teeth, and those with back quarters are all risk factors for treatment failure where there may not be a clinical or bacterial cure. And so this is where the, the choice of the, the cow at the start of the treatment is really key, because if um, these sorts of cows are being um, targeted for treatment, um, as you know, no antibiotic will, will, um, uh, may, may work. So as you can see, the reasons for treatment failure relating to cow factors are numerous and difficult to manage on farm and within a treatment protocol. And then lastly, there are the people factors that contribute to real and perceived treatment failures. One of the most common reasons is, reasons is treating a cow that has only a few flecks and more than likely a teat canal infection. And then add in an inframammary tube forced in with little cleaning and there you go, you've infused a gram negative bacteria from the teat end and done a good job of giving the cow mastitis. Further, the use of a rapid mastitis test to define treatment success following clinical mastitis is sometimes used and interpreted to mean that the cow has not been success successfully treated. We do know, however, that this is, an un this is unreliable given that many cows take three weeks for their white cell output in the udder to, to, to come down. Um, as Steph said before, not following label direct directions, maybe an excessive delay um, in the diagnosis and treatment, inappropriate supportive treatment such as anti-inflammatories, cows not milked out adequately, um, unreliable recording system so that you don't know that a cow's been treated uh, several times, um, a treatment uh, program yeah, whether there's missed or delayed treatments or a shortened treatment. Um, and that bottom one there, uh, the depth of the insertion of the cannula that's been studied, um, we know that by at least endeavouring um, uh, within the, the, uh, the practicalities of, of doing it, where possible to, to only partially insert the cannula of an intramammary tube um, will lead to um, higher cure rates. So now that the table's complete, you can see that we shouldn't be rushing to apportion the blame on the drug when there are many reasons to be interrogated and mostly to the right of the table. So thank you for taking the time with us to step through the process of clinical mastitis management. In a way, it's simple and on the other hand, it's very complex and needs um, inquiry. Using this process will ensure that you, you are thorough in your questioning to understand processes on farm. And we hope that this provides a welcome relief to the age old question of what's the strongest drug. So given the evidence and experience, meaningful improvement to clinical mastitis management will not come through changing a drug or adding a drug. It will come through identifying and improving the way in which mastitis is diagnosed choosing the right cows to treat and improving how intramammary products are infused. There is plenty of work on offer if you're prepared to look and ask questions and listen. And so with that, we'll take some questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, so uh, if anyone's got any questions, if you just hover down the... Um, bottom part of your screen, you'll, you'll see a little ribbon um, pop up um, with an option for chat. If you just want to type your questions into the chat box uh, and I can pass them on to Mark. 
Um, so, Mark, the first question was from Rob Bonanno. Um, so, Mark's question, uh, sorry, Rob's question was, do you think a positive mycoplasma PCR without a positive mycoplasma bovis result um, should be followed up with VAT culture in a herd with increasing BMCC or ignored? So, positive mycoplasma PCR, so a mycoplasma species PCR, uh, but with a negative mycoplasma bovis. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the most appropriate sort of course of action there is uh, to, um, I think we need to really emphasise the importance of individual cultures from um, either clinical cases or, or high cell count cows. Um, and obviously there's, there's probably limited uh, laboratories that can speciate um, mycoplasma, but um, I, I would suggest uh, uh, taking, taking individual samples and sending it to um, uh, a lab such as um, Sydney University where they can speciate uh, because you'll um, hopefully find the, the reasons for that. But also I suppose um, understanding that um, there are there are some limitations to the PCR test and that um, it, it I think it serves as a as a sort of a, uh, a little bit of a, a warning, I suppose, and then, um, and it really should stimulate um, going, going back to, to individual cultures. So um, I, that, that would be my method rather than um, moving to a, a bulk tank, another bulk tank sample, because yep. you want to understand what's happening with, with the cows that are affected, clinical or subclinical. Great, thanks Mark. Um, so Pete DeGarris is asking, do you have any comments on the differences in practical relevance between a clinical and bacteriological cure? So clinical versus bacteriological. I suppose practically um, where, you know, we, we, live in the, we live in the world of, uh, of clinical cures. Um, so the question was around um, the practicalities of it. I suppose um, we do know that if there is not a bacterial uh, cure, um, that they're at, at a much greater risk of, of repeating and um, of having a higher cell count. So um, I think um, it's interesting, uh, another paper I read the other day um, by Scott McDougall um, looking at um, so they, they find these differences in, in clinical and practical, uh, sorry, uh, cl clinical and bacteriological cures, but then where they, um, where they observe what's actually happening in terms of farm practice um, and where people uh, elect to extend uh, treatment. Um, I, I think I recall correctly that it's um, in 42% of the cases where farmers elected to extend the therapy, there was in fact no bacteria, bacteria isolated. So uh, it's a good question and probably of, of, of limited sort of um, uh, practical application, I think. I'm not sure what you think, Steph. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I'm not sure whether that answers your question, um, Pete, but it's probably, it might be something I might, I'm just going to jot down and make a note. Um, so as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, we are looking to developing a webinar specifically around bacterial ID methods. So culture, technologies, etc. cetera. Um, we might put that on the agenda, perhaps to discuss at the next one um, a little bit further, Pete, and we can do a bit more explanation for, uh, exploration for you. Um, so Mark, uh, Lucy Collins would like to know um, how does interpreting the anti-biogram influence your treatment recommendations? And I probably answered that in my last comment, but did you want to make a, a brief comment on that? Yeah, I think, we... it, yeah I think it's probably best um, handled uh, rather than just quickly now um, as part of a, another webinar. But certainly, um, yeah, we do need to uh, we do need to uh, support people's understanding of the interpretation of that. Um, typically, any biograms uh, globally are, are used to monitor uh, trends over time. 
Um, so we can talk about that um, if there's support for another webinar. Yeah, this is a great question. So to both Lucy and Pete, I've made notes of your questions. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you guys are, are if the, the bulk of the group is keen to have another webinar to sort of explore some of these things a little bit further, um, absolutely, we can we can put one on. Um, so Mark, this might be a question for me. So I've got a question from Sarah Ballantyne. So if medications are being used off label, how long should the withholding period be extended by? And is there a general guideline that you can apply for all medications? Um, did you want me to answer that one, Mark? Ah, uh, please. Great. So, um, Sarah, the short answer is in Australia, we don't have any specific guidelines around um, how uh, how long the withholding periods need to be extended if we do uh, need to um, go off label for for whatever reason. Um, certainly in the UK, um, the UK equivalent of the Vet Practitioners Board um, has put out sort of some general guidelines, um, which, you know, we haven't, as I said, we haven't got here, um, but I'd be happy to, to send you that um, directly. Um, and their guideline is, is as a minimum seven days, um, but I'd be, I think probably one of the major call outs is that we just don't have the evidence to support um, that decision making um, here in Australia, and I think one of the things that may be worthwhile considering um, is doing uh, individual antibiotic residue testing on those cows. Now, it does have some limitations, um, but when you think about the potential risks um, involved uh, with a residue violation and certainly the cost um, that it may sort of, that a farmer may incur if, if they do have an um, antibiotic residue violation, an individual um, antibiotic test to check that cat that, that's appropriate for the drug that's used because not all antibiotic tests will test for all residues. Um, check the cow and make sure that she's negative before she goes back into the vat um, will probably um, sort of help provide a bit of support for your decision making and practice. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. We don't know. Um, there's some international guidance, but we, yeah, some individual antibiotic residue testing is, is certainly something that's worthwhile considering. And that can be done via most of the, um, the milk processes. Um, okay, so the next question, uh, Mark, is from Rob Moyle. Um, so is extending treatments for strep uberus recommended? Um, I suppose, um, and it's a great question around extending therapy. I think it still comes back to the process of um, understanding what's happening on farm and whether there uh, can be improvements made in that process. Um, there's, there's lots of uh, research around extending therapy um, uh, and, and is, is linked with the last uh, obviously with the last question as well with the, the the dangers there and and perhaps because of because of those risks I think it's imperative that we as practitioners um, and trying to support these improvements do look at um, the way in which cows are being selected for treatment um, and how they're being diagnosed and uh, both at the start and at the end uh, so before they go back into the vat, um, because I think there's, it, it's, it goes back to that slide around um, real or perceived treatment failures, where um, I think if we're making good choices over the, the types of animals to treat, because um, you can appreciate the difference between, um, and Kiro and Scott McDougall have done some great work on this, if you want to get into to some you know, predictive modelling is that you can, you can appreciate that the difference between um, a five-year-old cow that's had a cell count um, and she's got multiple quarters affected, compare, compare that uh, and, and she's got a, a, a staph aureus and you compare that to a two-year-old with one quarter affected with no prior history of clinical case or, or cell count, that's an entirely different uh, proposition. So, um, and now not to say that um, th that uh, that culling I is your answer, but um, it certainly has to be um, a lot sharper on on many farms um, if if you're going to make headway with the amount of uh, bacteria in a system. 
So a long way of saying, I think that it still comes back to um, really checking through those processes. And um, as I tried to make the point earlier on, um, you only really know once you're there and you're looking and listening as to what's going on during treatment to understand some of the more intricate details of how decisions are made. But once those are, um, you know, uh, ticked off, I think, um, yeah, then there's, then, then there's questions around um, extending from, from that point, but uh, most, most farms won't get to that point. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I, I, I think um, certainly uh, there sounds like there is, uh, I've just received a message from Kuro from Adelaide Uni and he said there has um, been some work presented at the American um, Bovine Association. So I'll get in touch with Kuro. Um, if anyone would like more information on that, um, I can act as a bit of a conduit to get you some more information. So please, um, if you want to send me an email directly um, and either Mark or I can be in touch um, to, to help um, point you to some some more information. So um, it's two o'clock mark and that's um, probably about all we've got time for. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to um, pass on a really big thanks to Mark for, um, it was a fairly considerable amount of effort to pull um, the research and the evidence together um, for this webinar. And um, uh, it's hard to cover it all in an hour. So hopefully it's been really valuable to you um, in your work. Uh, and we are really keen to hear from you guys um, in terms of what sort of things do you want to explore more. So certainly we've heard a little bit about um, utilising some of these diagnostic technologies further. Um, that is something that we've sort of got in the pipeline. So it'd be great if you, if you could let us know if, if you do want us to run um, more webinars um, uh, specifically on diagnostics, but are there other topics that you'd like us to cover? Um, if you scan the QR code on your screen, or I'll um, send you a link as well um, via the chat. Um, if you just jump in there, I know um, it can be a little bit deaf by survey, um, but it is really important to us to make sure that we're feeding you the information that you want to know about and to make the most of your time too. Um, so if you let us know, um, first of all, how you found the webinar and second of all, um, what more, um, what things that you'd like to know more about, um, we'd really appreciate it and we'll take it on board and um, work on delivering it to you. So. Any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact Mark or myself directly. Um, uh, and if we could ask you to, to fill out the survey for us, um, we do read them um, and we really value the, the information that you feed back to us. And um, yeah, really big thank you to Mark and also to Sahab um, from our learning and development team for the technical support today as well. Um, so enjoy your day, everybody. And thank you very, very much for your time this afternoon. Thanks, Steph.